Today we are talking about Zoltan Kodai's piece called Dances of Galanta. Galanta. I can pronounce Zoltan Kodai, but I can't pronounce Galanta. As always when talking about music, I will be leaving links for music if they are available in the description, and I will also leave recommended videos that I will handpick that will help you with the topic of the video. So typically these are the videos that pop up in the last 20 seconds of the video. Sometimes I link them below, but you can expect them in the last 20 seconds of the video. Time doesn't mean anything anymore, so there is no schedule that I am adhering to when I upload things like this. Yeah, just make sure that uh, you subscribe and click the bell so that you get notified every time I upload because it is all over the map. I'm going to talk about the piece just a little bit, and then I'm going to play the piece at the end, and in the middle we're going to talk about like what actually to do and things that will help you. So really quick, Dances of Galanta. Zoltan Kodai is a Hungarian composer. And in a lot of his music, he features a lot of folk songs from around the area where he grew up. Folk music that originates in the town of Galanta, kind of along the railway tracks because his dad was the station master in Galanta. He was commissioned to write a piece for the 80th anniversary of the Budapest Philharmonic Society in 1933. So he took folk songs that he heard as a kid, but he also collected specific folk songs from the area where most of the melodies are actually from a volume of Hungarian dances that was published about a hundred years prior to him writing the piece and was published in Vienna. A little bit about the structure of the Dances of Galanta. So it begins with an orchestral introduction, and then it goes into what we're all here for, the clarinet solo and cadenza. The actual cadenza itself isn't even a bar long, but we'll get to that in like a minute. And then after the clarinet cadenza, we have this Andante Maestoso section, which we will also get to because that's also on a lot of auditions. It comes right after the clarinet cadenza kind of leads into it. And so we'll talk about that as well. So that's those are the three main parts. And then after the Andante Maestoso section, we have a passage that begins with a sort of an allegro moderato sort of tempo. And then that sort of breaks off into four um, different dances that are separated by these sort of brief references to the allegro moderato section that begins the section. So it's in like two major sections. The one that is comprised of those three sections that we talked about, the intro, the clarinet cadenza, and then the andante, ma andante maestoso section. And then we have the allegro moderato section where it's just like this eruption from the orchestra and it's such a fun piece. It's like one of those pieces where if they end the concert with it, you like leave the concert hall singing the melodies of the piece. So let's talk about the excerpt. You're gonna want to have your music in front of you as I'm going over this. I'm gonna be going over it kind of quickly. Um, if you don't have your own part, a good place to go is or orchestraexcerpts.com and it has this entire excerpt on that website and I'll link the exact page um, in the description. But um, it has not only the excerpt, but it has three examples of ways to play it. One is the Hungary Philharmonic, the other is the Budapest Philharmonic, and the, the last one is, is, I believe, the Chicago Philharmonic. So you can hear a number of different interpretations and different clarinetists playing it. It is in an excerpt for a clarinet, so if you try to play along, just know that it's going to sound real, real crunchy if you're on B-flat and I'm on A. It begins with two a two-measure introduction that the orchestra is still playing, so you want to play that forte and you want to keep it in tempo until the trill. And it, it might be easier to think of this in four, like it says lento equals 54, which if we think about it with the eighth note having the beat, it would be 108, which is double 54, but we want to feel that subdivision. And you want to put little carrot articulations over the articulation in the first bar so that they're nice and marcato. So when we get to the F sharp trill, it trills to G natural, it's a subito piano. You want to end the trill on the F sharp 
and then there's typically a pause after the fermata. And that's just wood shedding, and the reason why I think about it in four is so that we're thinking 1 E and a 2 E and a 3 E and a 1, and then you can practice it in eighth notes and get it faster and faster and faster, but it's going to be around that speed. And then there's typically a little bit of a lift after the B flat where we reset and go to the F sharp. The F sharp to the B flat before that second trill, easier fingering would be to do one and two. We're familiar with the one and one B flat, but since we're coming from an F sharp going to a B flat, one and two works just as well. The fermata you want to hold for around two pulses and then this the second trill on the F sharp goes right into it there's no lift after the fermata but you still want to focus on ending the trill on the F sharp because that's technically the first note of the run that goes down when we come out of that we have a poco stringendo, so it just gets faster as we go on. So I like to think of it in four at first, and then a couple of measures in, I switch to two. So it, it's one, two, three, four, da da one, two, three, four, da da dum, ba da da, da 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 da, da da da, breathe, da da da. So we're gonna want to breathe before that last sixteenth note that leads up to the E flat. And and you want the same sort of articulation and it does say poco a poco crescendo under it. So you want to sort of build the energy in not only speed but also dynamic. So when we get to the E flat, it's fortissimo and we want to even crescendo more through that because this is where the clarinet cadenza, this is building up to the clarinet cadenza. We want it to be very very loud. And then you want to sort of hold it and then take your time coming into that big run down. You want to put a tenuto on the C natural that's right after it and that's going to be sort of your jumping off point. And you want to stay loud until you get to that fermata at the end. You want to take your time into it and then a cello rondo through it. And then the cadenza begins. So you want to group the cadenza. I have these little brackets over it and I'll find a way to put it on the screen. So we want to group the first one um, from the G to the C basically. That's the first group. Second group is, and then we want the second G, and then the second bracket. You can add the G in this group too, because then it goes down to the D and that can be another bracket. We get a little quick in the middle, but then the last group of 30 second notes, there's a rallentando over it, so we want to slow down to the A that trills to the B flat. And then when we get to the trill, there's no fermata over it, so we want to keep that in tempo. And a good way to keep it in tempo is to have the metronome going because we're coming out of this very free cadenza and we need to be right in tempo. So it's good to practice this more with a metronome than without a metronome. And we're going to think about it in eighth notes again. And you're going to want to add a little bit of a crescendo. Dee da 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 da. It's the same thing coming out of the trill where you want to end the trill on the A and just practice that a couple times.
without the squeak would be preferable. Going into the Andante Maestoso section, this is a section that I played for months with the metronome. So it's between 76 and 80. So I'm gonna put it on 78, which is right smack in the middle. The run that leads into it should be in the tempo of the Andante Maestoso, which is the same reason basically a lot of the feeling of this piece is gonna come from just lots of work with the metronome. And we want to really place the triplet once we get into the section. Really be deliberate with the placement of that. Maybe put some space in between the dotted quarter note that's going to come before it. We want to do the triplet so that we land on the B flat. And keep in mind there is a key change here. Um, so that we land on the B flat with force because it is an accent but it's under the slur. So we want to accent that with the air. I'll try to figure out a way to put this on my screen, but you will see that I have slash marks where every downbeat happens so that it's correct. Because you don't want to learn this the wrong way, you want to learn it right the first time. No one's going to judge you for putting slashes where the downbeats are. And this is a section especially where it's so syncopated and it's going to be so with the beat that you might as well just take some of the thinking out of it and put the slashes there. And we want to start relatively quietly. It does say piano, so we want to keep that in mind. Nice and piano. And there's a poco crescendo that's marked one, two, three, four, five bars after we start the Andante Maestoso se section. So it's essentially a very, very gradual crescendo up until around bar 62. On that 13th measure, a diminuendo starts until the very end of the excerpt, but we want a crescendo up until that point very, very gradually. It says piano espressivo. Keep the musicality in keeping the rhythm, keep the energy in the eighth notes that have staccatos over it, because we want those to be sort of round. We don't want... That's not the kind of staccato we want. The more round a staccato, the better. And you just want to be playing this with a metronome as much as possible. It's easy to get sort of seduced by the melody. That octave is going to be so much easier if you roll the first finger down and sort of do a half hole fingering. It just makes everything so much easier so that the lower octave comes out when you roll it back and it gives us that nice legato bum bum instead of bum bum. A lot of this is just woodshedding and metronome work. The book that I'm using is called The Working Clarinetist with Peter Hadcock. And it's set up in that it gives you the excerpt and then over here on this page it gives you notes and tips and tricks and fingerings and um, like what they're looking for in, in the audition. So it's a really good book to have if you're looking to take some auditions. Basically everything that I went through is from the section over here that tells you about it. Um, but a lot of it has just been through my own practicing, um, how I like to think about it, and also teachers that I've had and master classes that I have attended. So now I'm going to play it. Hopefully I can do it. This is the first time I've played my clarinet today, so hopefully it will go well.
that is the excerpt. Keep in mind all of the details, all of the accents, the uh, tonguing patterns, um, and the dynamics. Um, and this sort of starts a new series that I'm doing where I'm going to talk about orchestral excerpts that are commonly used on orchestral auditions. So the next one is going to be Midsummer Night's Dream. So hopefully this helped. Um, if you have any questions about it, leave them down in the comments. That is Dances of Galanta by Zoltan Kodai. Go practice.